Um, our, our next speaker is, um, is another Michael. Um, it's um, Michael Shortall, who is our um, registrar in, of the Pontifical University, and he's also a lecturer in moral theology. And um, what Michael is, uh, Michael Shortall is going to speak on, he's got, drawing on his own personal experience. He is speaking on grief observed when mourning is restricted. So thank you, Michael. I hand over to you. So thank you, Jesse, and uh, welcome to everyone. I'm hoping that you can all hear me loud and clear. Um, so you're all aware, um, unfortunately, we're in our third lockdown at this point. But I get a sense of a mood, uh, certainly here in Ireland, for those who are uh, listening in from abroad, that there's a kind of a fear in the air that uh, was present in the first lockdown and not quite so present in the second. Uh, so on all our restrictions have returned, businesses are shut, we all have to stay at home, we're unable to visit the ill and the dying, and only 10 people are allowed at funerals. So all the usual practices that we have around funerals and grieving have been significantly restricted. There's a little book that many of you will know of, A Grief Observed by C.S. Lewis, that begins... No one ever told me grief would feel so much like fear. He continued, I'm not afraid, but the sensation is like being afraid. So there is a sense in which we're not just fearful of getting sick. There's a sense in which we have communally going through something of a grieving process that we have to let go of so much. But I'd like to focus just for the next little while upon the actual process of grieving and how it has been affected or might have been affected uh, in this past year or so. While each experience is unique, it's possible to recognize various tendencies and processes. There are a number of approaches, as some of you will know, to the progression of grief. And the most common one, the most popularly known one, is that by Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, uh, which she first charted out in 1969 in a little book called On Death and Dying. She suggested five stages. The first is denial, in which the individual struggles to accept the reality of the situation. The fact of loss is mistaken or considered to be false or unbelievable. And so other realities can be created or clung to. However, reality does come to bear eventually and the person can become frustrated, especially with those who are close to them. And this overflows into the second stage of anger, questioning, blaming, that sense of injustice. The third stage then moves to an attempt to negotiate the way through the pain that is being felt. In grieving, death can be manifest as a kind of a pondering, if only, if only I'd done this, if only I'd done that. And with those sort of questions can come uh, feelings of guilt. The fourth stage is the recognition of mortality as it's finally hitting home. And here the person can retreat into themselves, becoming sad and sullen. And it leads eventually to the final stage where the mortality of another, indeed of oneself, is accepted and a new stable balance of emotions occurs. But in spite of its popularity, this stage-by-stage uh, -stage process hasn't been fully corroborated by the research since. Grief does not follow stages like a timetable. But in fact, the most significant criticism is that it gives the impression that the individual is passive when it comes to mourning. It's something that happens to you over which you've got no control. There's now a greater understanding that actually to grieve well is to take to yourself some sense of effort or participation in the process of grieving. The grieving needs to find a way and therefore there must be some attempt, not so much a control, but here's a phrase that many of you will know and appreciate. Grieving is about muddling true. Did you do the best that you can 
but in some sense, you've got to do something. My own father passed away during the first lockdown. He didn't die of COVID-19, but his care and his dying and our mourning were all shaped by it. Some of the rituals had to be abandoned, but others because of technology took on new forms. We too only had 10 people at his requiem mass. We had a small funeral, but half the world was there. That's what my mother said afterwards, because so many people turned up on the live stream on the parish website and left condolences on rip.ie or sent cards, rang and the like. My sister lives abroad and couldn't make it home and because she's a frontline worker. But she did make it home in that window of opportunity just before Christmas. And I was very struck by the desire of my mother to talk through every single sympathy card. My poor sister had to sit there and listen to every single one and who sent it and who they were and how they were connected and what they meant and so on and so on. So while my mother found it difficult to talk about her loss, she actually, what she was doing and what she did in many other ways was she kept talking about the kindness of so many other people. She was, as we see so many people doing during time of grief, she was turning to the goodness and trying to identify it that was also present in her pain. Now, I'd like you to kind of hold that image a little bit in your mind as just, and I'll double back on it in a moment. Kubler-Ross wrote a second book on our five stages called On Grief and Grieving. And it was written by, with a young uh, person called David Kessler, who was uh, an expert in palliative care. Last year, out of his own professional and personal experiences, he actually returned to those five stages because Kessler himself had lost his youngest son at the age of 21. And he recognized that there was a sixth stage to grieving and one that is less passive and one that captures that idea of participating or being active in how we navigate our way through grief. The sixth stage he calls meaning, finding meaning. And he, uh, just to give a quote, a couple of quotes, meaning comes through finding a way to sustain your love for the person after death while you move forward with your life. Loss is simply what happens to you in life, but meaning is what you make happen. Now, meaning does not necessarily bring peace in grief, but ultimately, however, there is meaning in the life you can lead after death. The real question though is, well, how do you do it? And in this one important thing I think he does is that he reflects on the role of what he calls witnessing. So for example, in a recent podcast, he said, each person's grief is unique as their fingerprint, but what everyone has in common is that no matter how much they grieve, they share a need for their grief to be witnessed. That doesn't mean needing someone to try and lessen it or reframe it for them. The need is for someone to be fully present, for someone to be fully present to the magnitude of their loss without trying to point out the silver lining. Witness is actually quite a powerfully religious term. Perhaps it's not a phrase we use all that often in the Catholic tradition, but religious practices of debt do provide a very stark yet safe space and a process by which the reality of death can be faced and can be witnessed to, and it can be done over and over again indeed. And so in that process, uh, meaning can be made and the person can be reintegrated into a new life without, uh, or life can be remade without uh, 
the person for whom the griever is grieving. So it comes now to where we are at as a society right now. I do have a concern. My fear is that the long-term social impact of the current restrictions might be having an effect upon the grieving process. Um, actually, just on a side note, uh, for some of you may not know this, but it's kind of an important one. Um, among all the, the few loopholes that allows you to travel beyond your five kilometer limit, one of them is to visit a grave. Um, so that might be important for you just to keep in mind if you need to get out of your five kilometer uh, restriction. Um, but what I'm getting at here is that the social practices that facilitate the process of grief have been very, very much restricted. And it makes more difficult this process of witnessing to loss and therefore to making meaning. There is a privatization happening that's affecting the communal practices that were uh, particularly strong here in Ireland. Now, this is not just a sociological concern or a psychological one. It's actually also based upon the Christian perspective of grief, I would argue. Catholic funeral and mourning practices are underpinned by a perspective about what grief is about, which in turn is underpinned by an understanding of what it means to be human in relation to the divine. From this point of view, from a Christian point of view, grief is not a private affair. Grief is not a trauma to be solved like a problem. It's not reducible to a therapeutic process. Rather, grief is a fully human experience. And as a result, it should be treated as such. And I'd like to suggest four important elements of the Christian approach to the experience of loss that taken together kind of argue against this privatization. Firstly, from a Christian point of view, loss is best expressed as lamentation. The scriptures provide many examples of loss being articulated as a full range of emotion. To experience loss is to experience we might describe passionately as in like fully of your full emotions, whatever they may be. Um, whether it be sadness, complaint, blame, anger, and all of this can indeed, and perhaps even should be directed at God. For example, nearly a third of the Psalms can be described as lamentation. And the role of lamentation, I think, would probably be touched upon by other um, uh, inputs today and certainly will be in the book. Secondly, Christian belief attests that loss as an element of suffering is actually integral to life itself. The Paschal mystery, that is the death and resurrection of Jesus, puts loss and consequently grief at the very center of God's salvific action. So mourning and grief should not be denied or compartmentalized, not only because it's psychologically unhealthy, but because that's actually the very place in which the crucified God can be revealed. Pope Francis, for example, said, much energy is expended on fleeing from situations of suffering and the belief that reality, that that reality can be concealed, but the cross can never be absent. Thirdly, loss is a deeply social concern. While the social practices regarding mourning are vital for a healthy society. In a Christian light, it is also a matter of lived discipleship. To have a concern for our neighbor is a practical expression of our concern for God. So that's why Pope Francis would conclude, knowing how to mourn with others, that is holiness. It's very succinct and very to the point. Fourthly and finally, loss is hope-filled. St. Paul writes to the church in Thessalonica, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who have died, so that you may not grieve as others who do not hope. Paul didn't say, don't grieve at all. Rather, grief, that muddled emotional pendulum 
is placed in a new context. Indeed, that death is not the end actually provides the space for it to be fully experienced. Because without hope, grief can too easily become self-pity or despair, rather than in its fullest expression as a recognition and honor of the loved one who is lost. Just finally, the death notices on local radio. I'm sure many of you are from rural parts of Ireland and are aware of the, the structure of the day that's put on the death notices in many country homes. Each one, and certainly my home is um, uh, Northern Kilkenny. And so my local radio is KCLR and the death notices are read three times a day. And even now, almost a year later, each death notice is finishing with a line that in effect says a memorial will be held at a later date. So there's a name and there's a phrase, a memorial will be held at a later date. It reminds me of a litany that we might hear at mass, the incantation that's offered after every name. Well, my dad died on April 7th last year. And I don't think any grieving families back then realized just how much longer we'd have to wait for a memorial. But the question that I'd like to leave you all with is that when the time does come, can the church be a place that is called to be an agent of healing in the world in this regard? Because for all the uh, criticism that can be leveled at the Irish church, fairly or unfairly, one more uh, common affirmation is its role uh, when in, in the process of uh, death and dying and funerals and so on. So to return to that area, how might the church be an agent of healing and be a place where people can, can continue to make me meaning, that is to witness or to speak, remember and ritualize how they modeled through their own grieving. So I'll just leave it at that. Um, and uh, I'm open to any questions that anybody might have. Thank you very much, Michael. There are some questions coming up on the chat. Um, one from Father Tony. Given the removal of being with a loved one who is dying in hospital, if it's the COVID, if it's COVID related in which you won't see your loved one, and it may have been weeks or longer since you have seen them, how does one support the grief process and give witness to that person? That's a very good question. I have a, a truncated experience of that in that um, I, I, I could only get to see my father about, um, it was about 36 hours before he died. We were only allowed in one family member at a time. And even then it was only for 20 minutes, half an hour. Um, and so uh, I must admit it's a, it's, it's a heartache. And I think Father Tony, that's what it needs to be named as. Um, I think um, the, we need to be able to speak frankly and honestly about how, about how it was. Um, and I think that's how we help people by actually being brave enough to be silent, to listen to them, tell their story, and indeed not to be afraid to ask them, how was it for you? What, tell me your story. What, 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 what happened? Um, and just, just leave it at those simple, short questions and be brave to stay with whatever way the story goes. Um, because it's in the, it's in the, that relationship that you create, which you provide the, 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 that witnessing, you're, you're, you, you're allowing that person to witness to what they, what they um, went through. I hope that answers a little bit of what you're saying. So the reason I ask, uh, Father Michael, is obviously as a hospital in Scotland, many a time you're the only one with someone who is dying. And I know from parish ministry that the experience of that is much different. Um, where you could go to a wake, you could spend the time 
but now where you can't go into a house, it's much harder to allow someone to tell the story. Yeah. It's great if the weather's good, because outside's fine. But at this time where the weather is much different, it's harder to allow someone to unfold their story. Yeah, I, I'd absolutely agree. And that's actually the basis of my concern. I have no answer to that, to your practical question yeah. uh, right now, because because the restrictions don't allow it. They're, it's very difficult to imagine ways to create face-to-face -face encounters when we're not allowed to have them. Um, obviously, we can use technologies and so on um, to create that kind of one-to-one -one encounters, or, but um, but it's a significant challenge. So in many ways, it's about trying to think, Tony, about what are we going to do when the restrictions are lifted? So not just simply that we go back to normal, but that we might actually lead a process of reflection, reintegration, you know what I mean? So we don't, we don't like come out of the tradition and go, yeah, it's great, and move on without some sense of processing what we've all been through. Yeah, um, thank you. I think the church is a part to play in that. It's a very significant part to play. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. There's a lot of food for thought there. Um, but thank you for that, um, I think, very, very clear exposition of something that, um, as you say, it's going. this is going to stay with us a long time after lockdowns are over. It really is a place where we need to be able to minister. And a reminder again to everyone that um, those, those thoughts, and some of it more developed as well, can be read in, um, in Michael's chapter in the book when it comes out. Thank you, Thank Jesse. You. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.